time together and is showing around town, sharing a couple meals together, and they stayed at our home last night. We just had a great time, and I think the kids had a good time too anyway. So, uh, Miss Jesse, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, turn to Ephesians 4, chap- yeah, chapter 4, verse 11 and 16 through 16. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. This is what it says. And he, who is Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So I want you to uh, imagine a football team with me this morning. A football team. Now this is a pretty dysfunctional football team, okay? The coach can explain the rule book really well, but he neglects all of his other duties. The quarterback tries to step up and lead in place of the coach, but he only runs the drills that he knows how to run, and so he uh, uh, is training everyone to be a quarterback. Over half of the players show up for the talks and the the huddles, but as soon as feet are needed on the ground to, to run the plays and to throw the passes, well, they leave to go do other things. There is uh, infighting over the the jersey. Make sure that's still on here. Infighting over the color of the jerseys. Uh, There is uh, some players who heard of a play from another team, and so they want to do that play here. And some of the players only show up on Christmas and Easter. Oops. I mean the first day of playoffs in the Super Bowl. So the season starts, the team takes the field, and, well, they lose pretty badly. In fact, they, they lose every single game of the season. The coach keeps explaining the plays to the, to the uh, players. Uh, some of the players um, only show up half the time, and the quarterback keeps running the, the same drills, and they can't understand why they aren't winning. Now, for us on the outside, the, the answer seems pretty obvious. But the team, they keep trying to do the same things over and over again and expect but never get a change in the results. Now, I'm a huge Vikings fan. I bleed purple and gold. Let's hope that I just explained the strategy for the Green Bay Packers this year. (laughs) Unfortunately, leaders not equipping others for their work or, or people being trained and equipped to function in only one way, or the bulk of the work falling on the shoulders of a few while the rest act as consumers and everyone just feeling a, a bit frustrated, isn't the description of any football team, but is actually a, a pretty accurate description of the current American church. See, a church with just one of these problems, one of these components, would be described as an unhealthy church. But the reality is, is that many churches have one or more of these problems. So the question before us this morning is, how can we fix these problems? How can we help a church become healthy again? Indeed, what does a healthy church even look like? Well, to answer that, let's look at Ephesians 4. I'm going to read it again because uh, God speaks through his word. Ephesians 4, join with me in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into every way into him who is the head, into Christ, 
from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, to understand this passage, let's first look at the context of this letter. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus is located in uh, modern-day western Turkey. It, Ephesus was known for its uh, multiple pagan cults, and it was a major city in the Roman Empire. In fact, at the time, it was the fourth or fifth largest port city in the world. Paul stayed in Ephesus for about three years, building up and, and teaching the church. But by the time he wrote this letter, he had been gone from Ephesus for about uh, three, or sorry, seven to eight years. Okay? So the Ephesians needed to have instruction and, and encouragement. The Ephesians were just like us. Okay? They, they, some were rich, some were poor, some were employed, some were servants, some worked in the city, others in small villages. They were committed followers of Christ living in the world. And they needed to understand the foundations of their faith in Christ and how to live in that reality. Now, I find it very telling that although Paul is, is writing to Christian churches, he spends the first three chapters explaining what the gospel is. Now, this is very important because to be able to live out the exhortations in, in Ephesians chapter 4, to be able to grow in the maturity in our faith as a church— we should first understand that our life begins through the gift of salvation offered through Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. See, be, uh, before coming to Christ, the Bible describes us as, as dead in our sin. Now, this is very serious language. Dead in sin means that we are, we are spiritually dead. We have no spiritual ability or, or understanding. Dead in sin means that there is nothing that we can do. No work, no striving, no effort that could wipe away our sins and earn our way to heaven. But God, God in his infinite grace, sent Jesus Christ to live a perfect life. And having lived a perfect life, he died on the cross in our place for the forgiveness of our sins and, and rose again, conquering death. Through his redemptive work, through, through Jesus Christ, he gives us the gift of salvation. He causes us to be reborn, to be spiritually alive. That if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be safe. We will be reborn, to be, to be spiritually alive. And we will be part of his bride, the church. And we'll need to, to seek the help and the direction and the encouragement of the rest of the assembled body of believers. But a fresh understanding of the gospel means that we join the church more as a rookie rather than a seasoned veteran. Even those who have been followers of Christ for a long time, we, we still do not have everything figured out. So just like a football team needs uh, training and practice, so too does the church need to strive to grow in their spiritual health and maturity. But often we try to go it alone right? Is that actually possible? Is it possible to, to mature outside of the church? Is there something equivalent to uh, practicing on our own instead of going to the team practices, or, or progressing at our own rate of motivation, or defining our own goals, and still being able to show up on game day? Essentially, can we do this on our own? Well, look at Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12 with me. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So first we see here that Christ gifted the church with leaders. Now to give in the sense of this verse is to set something forth for the benefit of others. It is for the benefit of others that, that the gift of leaders is given. Now, we often think of gifts as something that we should enjoy for our, you know, it's our, for our own enjoyment. Yet the leaders that Christ has given to his people are supposed to be used for the benefit of the church. So who are these leaders, and what is their purpose in the church? Well, the first group of leaders that is talked about here is the apostles. Now, biblically, the apostles are people who have, been personally, who have personally seen and been sent by Jesus Christ himself. 
The marks of a true apostle in uh, 2 Corinthians 12 are that they do signs and wonders and miracles by the power of Christ. So with that as the criteria for who an apostle is, I believe then that though that group of leaders uh, ceased with the passing away of the first disciples. The second group of leaders are the prophets. Now, biblically, the most common function of the prophet isn't uh, telling the future, as we may be tempted to think, even though they did tell the future. But the most common function was to foretell or to truth tell. Okay? The, the prophets in the Bible were people who stood up for the truth, who called out the sins of others, and who bluntly exhorted people to follow God's ways. The prophets explained the truth unashamedly in clearly defined black and white terms. The third group of leaders were the evangelists. Okay, the evangelists were the travelers who brought the good news to others. Now, every Christian is supposed to be a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the evangelists were especially uh, equipped and gifted to be able to do this and, in the context of this passage, to train and equip others to be better witnesses as well. The last two groups are connected in the Greek. They share the same definite article, but they also have their unique functions. The, the shepherd in the Greek is the pastor or the feeder or the protector of the local church. The pastor is called by God to care for the well-being of the local church and to protect them from spiritual danger. The teacher is known for their knowledge of the Bible and the ability to clarify truth in simple terms. So teaching is no doubt the, the, uh, the duty of all pastors, but the pastor takes on the extra function of defending the church against false doctrine and spiritual abuse. So just like uh, all thumbs are fingers, but not all fingers are thumbs, so too are all pastors teachers, but not all teachers are necessarily pastors. These are the leaders that Christ has gifted to the church. But the emphasis in this passage isn't on the leaders, but on the purpose for which Christ has gifted them and then gave them to the church. This purpose in verse 12 is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, the word for ministry here is translated as servant or, or, or service, okay? The word indicates a humbling service, a roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty type of service that is exemplified by Christ himself. But this equipping for ministry is not the end goal either. No, it is for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. See, just like the leaders are, are supposed to share their gifts, they've been given their gifts for the benefit of others, so too are the people equipped benefit of others okay we are equipped to use our equipping you know we don't hand a uh, hammer to someone and then tell them not to use it no we give them a hammer so that they can hammer in some nails well anything that is done by the church okay whether providing nursery care or visiting those in need or making meals for new parents or, or leading home Bible studies or outreach into the community or worship or VBS or, or cleaning the bathrooms. Anything and everything is the work of all committed followers of Christ to build up the church. See, it's only the leaders who are responsible for the works of ministry. It is the responsible of the believers in the church. Now, we often get this mixed up, right? Uh, many people expect that the leaders should do everything. The thinking goes something like, uh, why witness to a friend or a family member or a coworker when we can just uh, bring them to church and the pastor can do it for us? Or why lead a, a home Bible study when we can just join another one? Why do the work? Isn't that what the uh, leaders are supposed to do? But as we see in this passage, it's not. The leader's primary responsibility is to equip others for the work of ministry to build up the church. Every Christian, all of us, has a ministry and function in the church to help build up the body of Christ. So a healthy church, then, is a church equipped by Christ. That's our first point today. There's going to be three of them. A healthy church is a church equipped by Christ. From the leaders to the building up of the body, it is, it is all of Christ. He has given his people what is needed to build up the body. Three steps are taken in these two verses. First, Christ has gifted the church with leaders. Second, those leaders are supposed to equip 
of the saints, that's all of us, for the work of the ministry. And then third, the saints are supposed to use their equipping to build up the body of Christ. A healthy church is a church equipped by Christ. So it's humbling to know then, it is very humbling to know that Christ is working through us to build up the church. He, he not only gives us new life, but, but he gives the church leaders to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. What a, what a gracious Savior that we serve. So from here, Paul takes a step back from this pas- in this passage from looking at the players of the team and focuses on the purpose or the goal of the team. Okay, what is the church working towards? What is the objective? When have we arrived at the goal? Well, look at verses 13 and 14 with me. Until we all, it says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So the church should never think of the process without fixing and keeping its eyes on the goal. Paul breaks down these two, the, the goal into two parts in verse 13. The first part of this goal is reaching the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, as people gain a new life in Christ and come to the church from different backgrounds of, of error and ignorance and, and sin-filled lifestyles, we begin to move away from false teaching and false assumptions and towards the truth. Moving towards unity of the faith and of the knowledge of Christ means that we begin to understand and apply the truth of the gospel to all areas of our life. We, we rely on Christ and we abide in him and depend on him for his provision in all things. And as we move uh, in that direction, we move past head knowledge to heart knowledge. See, uh, knowledge is not just mental assent. It is knowing Christ and Christ knowing us in relationship. So we cannot know someone in a relationship if we do not communicate with them, if we do not hear from them or, they, or listen to them. So growing in our, our knowledge and, and, and attaining unity then involves the knowledge gained through serious study of God's word. It involves the discernment through the Holy Spirit's work to understand and apply it. And it involves prayer to God to grow in our relationship with him. If we are to attain unity as a church, we need to do those three things. Read God's word, rely on the Holy Spirit, and prayer. The second part of this goal is to become mature, okay? A maturity that is measured by nothing less than Christ himself, okay? Christ-likeness is the standard towards which we must grow. Now, now this maturity is difficult to pursue. The challenges of, of the devil and false teaching and our own sin can take us off track, and we are tempted to give up. But we cannot give up, okay? The full maturity in Christ that God intends for all of us requires that we exercise the gifts that Christ has given and and work to build up the church. We must become completely like him, fully Christ-like. But complete Christ-likeness is not actually possible in this life. We will not be perfectly sanctified until we are with God in his glory. But even so, this should not stop us from pursuing it now. I mean, after all, Christ has gifted leaders to equip the saints for the work of ministry, specifically so that we mature towards Christ. To settle for good enough or to become complacent denies the goal and the purpose of Christ's work. The goal of the church is to, uh, is to pursue Christ's likeness. It is to pursue unity. It is to pursue maturity. Now, what is stated in the positive in verse 13 is stated in the negative in verse 14. If verse 13 is our finish line, verse 14 is our start line. We need to move away from verse 14 and move towards verse 13. So in verse 14, Paul exhorts us to grow in maturity, 
so that we will no longer be wavering, easily tricked, and distracted children. Okay, children do not hold to the assurity of truth like adults hold. Like that one insurance company, adults know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. All right, a, a child falls and cries like they've lost their foot. An adult picks themselves back up, brushes themselves off, and moves on with the day. Uh, a child will cry when it's thundering and lightning outside because they are fearful. An adult can sleep through it knowing that it's just a mild thunderstorm. So a church here moving toward full unity in Christ is leaving behind immaturity with its intertwined characteristics of infancy, or sorry, of, of ignorance, of gullibility, and individualism. For the maturing Christian who leaves behind infancy, the states of ignorance and gullibility, stop being an excuse, become a, a catalyst for deep study and greater works of service. Every member in the church should strive to mature in their faith. We should not be immature consumers, but, but eager servants. We should, uh, instead of pursuing individualism, we should be pursuing unity within the body. See, through Ephesians, we see that immaturity is actually a very highly dangerous condition because it lays the church or the, the Christian open to the manipulation by cunning people and the forces of error. See, this is, this is not a neutral state for the believer, but rather a place where Christians fall prey to false teaching. So for the believer to mature out of this perilous state, he or she must actively participate in an equipped and serving church. And that participation, well, it won't be perfect right away. Okay, when, when we start to serve, we will stumble, we will, we will drop passes, we will run into the field goalposts. But over time, we will mature. Over time, we will learn where we fit in the team or where we fit in the church, where we can use our giftings. And over time, we will become seasoned veterans. See, we must realize then that to the extent that we neglect uh, using our equipping, working, serving, is the extent that we can actually cripple someone else's maturity. See, if I, in my own immaturity, doesn't, don't use um, my gifting or my calling as God has, has gifted me and called me to do, then I can actually hinder someone else's faith. I can actually hinder the entire body of believers. A healthy church, then, is a church that is maturing toward the standard of Christ. That's our second point for today. A healthy church is a church that is maturing toward the standard of Christ. The purpose of believers doing works of service in verse 13 is unity, maturity, and the pursuit of Christ like this. In verse 14, to disregard the equipping or the pr purpose of the believers is to stay immature, weak in faith, and faltering. A healthy church is a church maturing toward the standard of Christ. Now, on the football team, the quarterback throws the ball, the linemen guard the quarterback, and the kicker kicks, okay? Each player has their own specific duty and function on the team. Still, no matter what position they play, every player does lots of sprints during practice, right? They're all going to have to run. Well, in the same way, each member in the church has a different role in the body of Christ, there are various works of ministry to do in the pursuit of maturity. But Paul shows in this passage that there is a work in which the whole body engages. Don't worry, it's not sprints. I'd be in trouble. Look at verses uh, 15 to 16 with me. 15 and 16. It says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So this is contrasted with verse 14, okay, where Paul warns the Ephesians that deceivers will cause the immature to waver. He is telling the Ephesians to be different, okay? They are to speak the truth in love, now, the literal Greek here in verse 15 is truthing in love, but truthing isn't actually a word in English, but the idea is still pretty clear. 
Maturity involves truth telling, truth maintaining, and truth doing love. And this love is an agape love, a a love that seeks the benefit of others, even, even at our own expense and is intertwined with characteristics like humility and gentleness and and the willingness to work for unity and peace. The deceivers in verse 14 are not so. They're cunning. They're crafty. They're only looking out for their own interests. The Ephesians are to be different. We are to be different. We must speak the truth in humility and love. We do not look out for our own interests but for the interests of others. And we speak the truth. True love, God's agape love, humbly speaks truth, black and white truth, even when it's hard. And the result of this common work that we all participate in is that we grow up in maturity to the head, which is Christ. It's truth and love. It's a very simple formula that that grows us to maturity when we are all engaged in it. See, no longer immature and tossed to and and fro on the waves like a little boat in a storm. No, we we will grow in stability and in spiritual maturity, which is growth into Christ. Christ is the head, not man. No leader gifted to the church by Christ is the head of the church. The leaders are still sheep, a part of, of Christ's flock. And we are only called to a specific function, and that function is one of service. A true leader is a servant leader. Christ is the head. From Christ alone, we receive our capacity for growth and activity. Each member has uh, our distinct role in the well-being of the whole. The body obtains its unity through actually its diversity of roles, okay? It It is unified when we are diversified. It's the unity and diversity that is essential for the proper growth of the church. We do not seek our own growth. We seek the growth of the body. We do not seek our own building up, but the building up of the whole body. This is a spiritual increase, not numerical increase. And this increase, this building up, is above all in love. Love is the lifeblood of the body. It is the ultimate criteria for the assessment of church growth. How far are we characterized by true, truth-telling, Christ-like love? So a healthy church, then, is a church that works through Christ's direction. That's our third and final point for today. A healthy church is a church working through Christ's direction. The members of the body work towards their, their purpose by speaking truth and love, And Christ grows the body when each part of the body works properly. Not speaking the truth or not doing it in love shows that each part is not doing its work and that the growth of the body will be hindered. Okay, we we must each do our part as Christ has gifted us. A healthy church is a church working towards Christ's, or working through, sorry, Christ's direction. So through Christ, we have life. From Christ, the church is gifted. To Christ-likeness, the church moves. And it is through Christ making the body grow that the body matures. It is, it is all of Christ. He is supreme over all. Christ makes and grows his church. It is only through his grace that a healthy church is equipped. It is only through him that a healthy church matures. And it is only through his direction that a healthy church grows. This leads to our big idea for today, okay? Uh, Christ equips his church to mature through work and service. This whole passage, you know, this whole five, six verses can be summed up in this one statement. Christ equips his church to mature through work and service, to serve each other. This is the awesome power of Christ. See, the Christ who gifts Uh, gives gifts to the church, to whom the church matures and who directs the church, is the Christ who conquered all the forces of evil in the universe through his death and resurrection. All authority and in heaven and on earth is his, and he is therefore powerful enough to change us from being dead to mature and committed followers of him. And the beautiful reality of Christ's plan to effect this change is that we are a part of it. See, Christ equips us to keep false teaching at bay, to maintain unity, 
and to guide the church to reach its full, uh, to, of its destiny of full union with him. Through Christ, we are a part of something that started at the beginning of time and will not reach its full consummation until the end of all things. It's humbling to know that because of Christ, our life is more than the car that we own, the house that we own, our, our friends or our family or politics, or even for me, if the Vikings win the Super Bowl or not. Probably not, right? We have work to do that has eternal ramifications. Christ equips his church to mature through work and service. So in view of all of this, how do we practically live this out? Well, first, we need to get involved in the church. Okay? We cannot mature on our own. Maturity happens in the context of the body of believers. So when the church gathers, make it a priority to be a part of that gathering. The first step is to be actively committed to your church. Secondly, leaders, we need to focus on practically equipping Christ followers for works and service. Now, to do that, we need to have prayer, we need to have discernment, and we need to understand how God has gifted each person and what role they are meant to have in the building up of the body of believers. Spiritual assessments can, can be helpful here. They'd be a, a first step. But we need to equip each person in light of their gifting and with the needs of the church in mind. Members of the church, you too need to, need to be in prayer and seeking out your gifting and role in the church. See, it will no, do no good to learn how to do something if you're not gifted or called to that role. Be humble, be attentional, and, and be discerning towards God's leading. The next step is for the whole church. The whole church. We need to get to work. We need to stand up, do a few stretches, and then get to work. We need to see what needs to be done, and let's get it done together. Is, is the church reaching out into the community? Or how many times have we witnessed to our friends or family or, or co-workers just, I don't know, in the past month? Do, do we help out on Sunday mornings or, or on Wednesday nights? Or, or do we mainly sit in the services and then go home? Do we give of our money or of our time to the church? Now, those are just a few questions to, to open your eyes to possibilities, okay? There are so many possibilities, so many ways to serve. Look for them. Opportunities are, are all around us. And lastly, there is one uh, work that we are all to do, and that is to speak the truth in love. Take time this week and pray that God would grow in you the courage to speak the truth the compassion to do so in love, and that he would provide opportunities for you to put that into, into practice. It could be as small as giving uh, an encouraging remark to someone who is already faithfully serving. It could be as serious as gently calling out someone in sin. Whatever opportunity God presents, speak the truth and do it in love. Christ equips his church to mature through work and service. So let's step up, let's join together, and let's get to work. Join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this, this morning. Lord, and we lift this time up to you. Lord, I pray that uh, you grow in us this courage to be able to speak the truth, that we would not back down from... Uh, telling others what is in your word and for sticking up for the truth. But Lord, that we would be able to do this in love. Lord, open our eyes to the possibilities around us. Open our eyes to the possibilities of how we can help each other to grow in our faith and knowledge of you, to grow and mature towards Christ's likeness. Lord, grow in us uh, a love and an encouragement to do this, Lord, to, to pursue you, to pursue maturity in you. You are good. Lord, help us to live our lives in, in that reality, to live our lives by your word. Guide us, Lord, as we go throughout the rest of this time of, of worship, um, through uh, communion, Lord, through, uh, through singing. Lord, just uh, help us to worship in every action and every word that we do today and throughout this week. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 
Now we are going to join into a time of communion.